how he threw his life and his wealth into the fray. I am reminded of my interview with President Sandro Pertini, another prosperous socialist, who described with relish his manual labor in France from 1927 to 1929, and how, with money inherited from his father, he had set up a clandestine radio transmitter beaming into Italy. After Pertini's arrest, a French police inspector asked, but why didn't you stay tranquil? Conscience and idealism led Pertini and Rosselli to back socialist beliefs with their personal financial means. Carlo Rosselli constructed his liberal socialism on a moral foundation. In his seminal Socialismo Liberale, written from Confino on Lipari, he traced his belief to Greek rationalism and the messianism of Israel. Learning liberty from the former, and justice and equality from the latter. Rosselli's book and much of his early post-war intellectual and political development began as a sharp critique of Marxism, which he condemned as a pseudoscience that ignored human will and assumed a too rigid class conflict. He contested the primacy of economic factors and the existence of any law of history. Under the Marxist rubric, Rosselli attacked Italian maximalist socialists, Soviet communists, and Italian reformist socialists. He blamed the fascist victory in part on maximalists, who had, in, who had threatened revolution and dictatorship while a minority, thereby providing reactionaries with a rationale for illegality. Rosselli urged socialist acceptance of democratic method and liberty on principle. There was no Marxist ethic, he declared, only one ethic of Socrates, Christ, and Kant. He contested communist dictatorship and bureaucracy in the Soviet Union, at one time positioning socialism between, quote, two bestial extremes, end quote, presumably communism and fascism. Having studied revolutionary syndicalism for his thesis, Rosselli favored decentralization over Leninism. Yet during the 1930s, he moved towards practical cooperation with communists against fascism and was not an anti-communist. Rosselli launched some of his sharpest and perhaps least fair barbs towards the reformist socialists with whom he was in close proximity. Resembling Gaetano Salvemini, he seems to have included them in a general criticism of Giolitian Italy and Transformismo. Rosselli castigated the reformist materialist positivism for losing the idealistic and voluntaristic younger generation. Reformist passivity, stemming from Marxist determinism, he alleged, contributed to fascist successes and the failure of the Aventine opposition. Rosselli's socialism, Carlo Rosselli's socialism, had its roots in liberty. But his socialismo liberale would extend 19th century liberalism from a privileged minority to everyone. Socialism, concrete emancipation of the proletariat, is liberalism in action, liberty for the poor. Socialism was also faith. The future remained open. Rosselli offered no ultimate truth or transcendent law. Human will would decide whether its opponents or socialism would triumph. Rosselli added that socialism required changes within individuals, the cultivation of certain essential values through education and the efforts of a long series of generations. He said, if men have rooted neither the sense of dignity nor responsibility, if they don't feel pride in their autonomy, if they don't emancipate themselves in their interior world, socialism cannot be built, and the barrack state would emerge. At the same time, he developed a more complex interpretation of Italian fascism than many others on the left. Rosselli argued that other factors had to be considered in addition 
to a fierce and blind class reaction in order to understand the full magnitude of the fascist threat. Nationalistic sentiment, fascistness, the romantic lure of action, post-war restlessness, latent weaknesses from the deeper Italian past, a cult of unanimity, a waiting for Pope, King, or Mussolini to act, and poverty all had weight. Fascism synthesis of old and new made it a formidable enemy whose strength would even burden the remaking of Italian democracy after Mussolini's defeat, Rosselli thought. His breadth of vision contributed to a keen realism towards the historical evolution of Italy and Europe. Fascism threatened with extinction Carlo Rosselli's deepest belief, and he became an implacable anti-fascist raising stone. In a liberal and democratic regime, he advocated peaceful means, but compromise was impossible between two mutually exclusive principles of the moral world. Fascism, first and foremost anti-liberalism, had destroyed all the middle ground, necessitating revolutionary method and violence to push it from power. In prison, he rejected a proper deal, explaining that for an example to be effective, it had to be pure and follow a line of morality of absolute intransigence. He looked for heroes ready for self-sacrifice, inspired himself by Giacomo Macchiotti and Ferruccio Pari, a prison cellmate in 1927. Resembling Martin Luther King, Rosselli wrote, All our life is concentrated on this effort to arrive for one hour at the highest point. Whoever has pulled himself up a rocky mountain will understand me. Even we are a group of climbers tied together. Pari helped me. I help others. We will arrive at the summit. The battle would be long, not years, but generations. And he said, we work for eternity. Soon after his arrival in France in August 1929, Rosselli and others established the Fistia et Libertà, which attracted socialists, liberals, Democrats, and Republicans. The movement's own internal politics and its frequently strained interactions with the Concentrazione Antifascista and Exile Coalition of the Non-Communist Left provide chapters in the perennial saga of the relations of socialists with each other and with their closest allies slash potential rivals. Rosselli and his chief collaborators, particularly Alberto Tacchiani, had an eye for daring action and symbolic gesture that rivaled Mussolini, as shown by the propaganda flight of Bastonese and Dolce from a swift meadow to Milan's central piazza in July 1930. It was a perfect Rosselli Tarkiani Gialisti venture, audacious, innovative, using a symbol of modernity, the airplane, reaching the minds of Italians living in the consensus factory. In 1932, Justitia Libertà published a program for a post-fascist Italy based on liberty, justice, essentially on the working classes, and a profound economic political transformation. The Republic, sorry, the framework offered a republic, a constituent assembly elected by universal suffrage, substantial agrarian reform, significant industrial reorganization combining central planning, some socialization but not of industries that were competitive and with autonomous management, <coughs> workers control in major workplaces, a state based on the widest economy, and other changes. A year later, with one of his bursts of insight, Rosselli understood almost at once the significance of Hitler's spiritual blitzkrieg. By 1932, Rosselli saw momentum shifting to the fascists, leaving anti-fascists with a desperate defense of our reasons for living. In a notable essay of November 1933, La Guerra que Tornar, The War That Returns, Rosselli asserted that fascism in power in Germany and Italy meant war. 
As bluntly, he prescribed preventive revolutions to topple Hitler and Mussolini and criticized sharply the pacifism and support for disarmament of many socialists in contrast to his own interventionism. For Rosselli, Hitler's rise and the inadequate responses to Nazism's threat raised the danger posed by Italian fascism to a European and international level and underscored an enormous crisis of democracy. From 1933 to 36, various developments drove the Société Libertad towards greater isolation and independence. A multifaceted competition for turf between GL and Pietro Nenni socialists, as well as other issues, contributed to the demise of the Concentrazione Antifascista. Soon thereafter, Rosselli temporarily downplayed the inert Italian masses in contrast to the revolutionary elite when only 50 or 100 or 200 people remain politically active in any Italian city. In another essay, he asserted, man is the end, not the state. As the Western democracies responded feebly to Hitler and, Italian, and as Italian fascism strengthened, Rosselli lost faith in the middle classes, emphasized more the proletariat, and looked more to the Soviet Union as a potential opponent of Germany. His icon iconoclasm alienated the Italian Socialist Party, while his socialism was too socialist for some geolisty and too liberal for others. At first, but not for long, Rosselli hoped that the Ethiopian War might open a revolutionary window for the anti-fascists. In March 1936, with stark realism, he responded at once to German remilitarization of the Rhineland, quote, a France that has not gone to war over the Rhineland will not do it for Austria, perhaps not even for Czechoslovakia, end quote. Four months later, events in Spain ended his decade-long wait for a revolutionary opportunity. The Spanish Civil War climaxed Carlo Rosselli's intense activity against Italian fascism and led to his death. Justicia Libertad plotted unsuccessfully for many years to assassinate Mussolini using planes and other means. When I asked the former Zealisti, Max Salvadori, if his organization had tried to assassinate the dictator, he replied, quote, We viewed Mussolini and the men around him as common criminals. Mussolini killed to reach power and killed to keep it. The Zealisti moved closer to the anarchists. With humor, Aldo Garoschi described the commemoration in the Italian capital after World War II. With the then distinguished ambassador to the United States, Alberto Tarciani, in attendance, at which cast the toast recalled the evanescent bombing of Rome. Responding apocalyptically, Rosselli leaped into the Spanish Civil War, stating, The battle in Spain will be decisive for the fate of fascism and anti fascism in Europe. After meeting with Andre Malraux in Paris, Rosselli personally led the first group of Italian anti-fascists, mainly anarchists, into early battles of the Spanish Civil War. He suffered a light wound, subsequently developing phlebitis that led him to the health spa of Daniel Delorme. In November 1936, Rosselli beamed his striking radio address from Barcelona towards Italy, OG in Spagna, Domani in Italia, today in Spain, tomorrow in Italy in which he predicted the spread of revolutionary anti-fascism from Spain to Italy. After the Italian fascist defeat at Guadalajara in March 1937, he appealed for a Guadalajara on Italian soil. Finally, in what became Rosselli's last battle, GL attempted to borrow planes from the Spanish government for an assault on Rome and also discussed a ground incursion into Italy. These imprecise schemes faded into an unsuccessful campaign to launch one plane from France on a propaganda flight to Italy. Italian fascism feared three things most. First, communism in Italy. Second, assassination attempts against Mussolini. Third, someone who might unite the Italian anti-fascist opposition. Carlo Rosselli posed the latter two threats and in the last months of his life, on practical grounds, sought better relations with Italy's communists. Rosselli became an Italian fascist obsession. From 1931 onward, 
Arturo Bocchini, Chief of Police, and Michelangelo Di Stefano, Director of Old became convinced that just justicia e libertà threatened Italian fascism and the Duke. Di Stefano's greatest triumph became the agent codenamed Togo, a French engineer portrayed as acting out of fascist idealism, who infiltrated the Libertà in 1933 with devastating impact throughout the remainder of Rosselli's life. As one example, information from Togo played a role in the arrest of the Turin section of Justicia Libertà. Following the breakup of the Concentrazione Antifascista, Di Stefano demanded from his agent a thorough assessment of its components. One report portrayed Rosselli as, quote, the most terrible, and concluded, the major danger comes from Rosselli, and it is absolutely necessary to assassinate him. Thus, a blunt appeal to kill the anti-fascist leader circulated as early as June 1934 in the upper reaches of Ulver. The first assassination attempt may have been made in March 1936. The Spanish Civil War intensified Italian fascism's hatred and paranoia towards Rosselli. From Spain, a fascist agent positioned Rosselli, quote, on the road to becoming the duce of Italian anti-fascism, end quote. On May 4, 1937, while one Italian police official wrote, almost all the activity of Justicia e Libertà in the kingdom is now in our hands through the network of informers. High-ranking representatives of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Finance Ministry, and Militia met under Bocchini's auspices to prepare the air defenses of Rome and Italy against what had become a single Giolisti plane under Togo's constant gaze. Months earlier, though, Italian fascist leaders had ordered Rosselli's assassination. As the Spanish Civil War lengthened, as the Italian fascist commitment to Franco deepened, and as Mussolini's relationship with Hitler's Germany became stronger and more complex, Italian fascism developed an extensive sabotage plot, one aspect of which entailed Rosselli's assassination. On January 29th and February 3rd, 1937, Santo Emanuele, head of the counterintelligence section of the Servizio Informazione Militare, SIM, Italian Army Intelligence, and Roberto Navali, chief of the Turin branch of the same organization responsible for France, developed a wide-ranging plan for destruction in southern France and elsewhere of material being sent to the Spanish government. They also targeted two men for assassination, Ernesto Bonomini, an anarchist, and Carlo Rosselli. To assassinate Rosselli, Italian fascism struck an accord with the OSAR as the extreme right-wing group prepared a coup d'etat against the French Popular Front government and the Third French Republic. The, the Cadrul committed the crime for 100 semi-automatic Beretta rifles and hope of future aid, even an alliance with Italian fascism. Filippo and Fuso, Foreign Minister Count Galeazzo Ciano's chief troubleshoot shooter served as a link between the highest fascist leadership and the Kagul. I have no doubt that Mussolini and Ciano made the decision to kill Carlo Rosselli. On March 22, 1937, in Monte Carlo, just after the Battle of Guadalajara, representatives of Italian fascism and the OSAR reached the accord that had its tragic denouement on that desperate pact of sacred earth in France two and a half months later. Italian fascism had Carlo Rosselli eliminated at the point where the Italian Civil War merged with a European Civil War that Rosselli was utilizing as a fulcrum to turn revolution towards Italy. His faith in justice and liberty, his quest for innovation, his strong-minded, realistic assessments, his charisma, and GL's persistent efforts to assassinate the Duce put Rosselli atop the anti-fascist ramparts. 
Stefano and Bocchini deceived him as he made mistakes of judgment that contributed to the loss of Giulisti cadres in Italy. Fascist leaders defeated him most of the time. Even with all the weapons of the police state, though, they feared him, could not control him, and killed him. Let me add some concluding remarks. I have qualms about Rosselli and Tarkiani's attempted authenticity. But Rosselli sharply distinguished between a free society and the repressive fascist dictatorship that justified resistance by every means. I would add, following Thomas Jefferson, what should one do when a dictator violates national rights, life, and liberty? In Rosselli's plotting against Mussolini, he approached the anarchist conception of power. Moreover, in explaining Giolisti policy, Aldo Garoschi traced the tradition of tyrannicide back to the Renaissance, while Max Salvadori bluntly said, we admired Brutus, not Caesar. Although he recognized that Italian fascism embodied far more than the dictator, both Rosselli and police chief Bocchini thought Mussolini's demise would lead to the unraveling of the regime. Rosselli clearly believed in the historical significance of the individual. Has not the 20th century proven him to be correct? Carlo Rosselli's Socialismo Liberale represents one of the significant chapters in the history of Italian socialism, even though he only belonged briefly to the Socialist Party. He was a socialist heretic, similar to the Hebrew prophets and Christian heretics. He contrasted a bleak present with a heroic past. Gaetano Arfe placed Rosselli's and Nemi's Porto Stato of 1926 as a vigorous transition linking pre-fascist and anti-fascist socialism. Rosselli is certain that in an age of mass politics, only a revitalized socialism could defeat Mussolini's dictatorship. A socialist maverick, his liberty-centered, voluntaristic, decentralized, in one respect elitist, and non-Marxist socialism, alienated many socialists and communists, while his vigorous commitment to equality and social justice pushed away many liberals. Justitia Libertas' path was lonely. Carlo Rosselli's open-ended vision of history contrasts profoundly with the terrible simplifications of this century. How much greater strength was shown by Rosselli's tragic and heroic embrace of spontaneity than by the so-called strong men of his era, Hitler, Stalin, and yes, Mussolini, who crushed liberty. A liberal socialist punk, Rosselli comprehended almost at once the fascist challenge to the highest Judeo-Christian humanist moral tradition of the West, that each individual's life is sacred, deserving of dignity. He understood early one of the most brutal realities of the 1930s, that if one wished to restore or preserve liberty, one needed to risk death. Winston Churchill's supreme moment in 1940, one of the greatest in human history, lay in his choice to fight Nazism and in couching his intransigent resistance in terms of the Western heritage of freedom. Carlo Rosselli made a similar choice 15 years earlier, during a period in which Churchill was, quote, being charmed by Mussolini's gentle and simple bearing. Quote. With startling bursts of insight and courage during the swift approach of one of the darkest moments in the long history of the West, Carlo Rosselli remained a protagonist in the field to the end. He deserves to be recognized as perhaps the greatest third force figure in 20th century Italian history, as one of the greatest Italian socialists, as one of the greatest 20th century Italians, and as one of the greatest European anti-fascists. Historians usually are little better than anyone else at predicting the future. No one can know with certainty 
with certainty what Carla Rosselli might have accomplished if he survived the ambush at Banyol. In his home country, soon he would have been proscribed as a Jew as well as an anti-fascist. With the men and women whom he inspired, he certainly would have participated in the Italian Civil War in the North from 1943 to 45. If he had survived the Holocaust and Civil War, one might speculate about his post-war role. Max Salvadori stated that Rosselli, quote, would undoubtedly have been the major political figure at the end of the war, combining in his own personality what was represented by Pari, de Gasperi, and Pertini, end quote. Aldo Garoso wondered what a political leader with Rosselli's exuberant energy and extensive knowledge of economics, who was already teaching Keynes to college students in the mid-1920s, might have contributed to an era of Reconstruction. Traditional wisdom has been that historical fortune never knocks on and never enters third, fourth doors. But recent years have been unkind to traditional wisdom. Rosselli grappled with one of the most nettlesome questions for the 20th century left. How can one utilize central authority to create greater equality without fostering fierce and totalitarian dictatorships? Rosselli's answer of a large measure of autonomy with some degree of plan always affirmed the duality of justice, mean equality, and liberty. As the century nears its end, might a moment for Carlo Rosselli's and the Giulisti Socialismo Liberale come round at last? The costs of the 25-year Italian Civil War were enormous for Italy. Among them, Italian fascism selectively killed or truncated and circumscribed the lives of a number of the most extraordinary 20th century Italian political leaders. Matteo, Giovanni Amendola, Gopetti, Gramsci, Rosselli, and others. Nevertheless, I insist that Carlo and Nello Rosselli were not solely victims. Listen to these defiant words of Nello writing to his brother in 1931. I am proud of you and of your activity. If at some time you feel alone or unheeded, chase away the thought. There is much fire under the ashes in Italy, even if the layer of ashes is heavy and hides it entirely. You will finish, we will finish with victory if you never give up, not even for one moment, not even one inch. Listen to Nello Rosselli's stunning epitaph for an earlier maverick Italian socialist, Carlo Pisacano and unintentionally for himself and his brother. The wayfarer, anxious to cross the torrent, throws stones one on top of the other into the depths of the water, then steps on the last ones that surface, securely, because he knows that those which have disappeared into the whirlpool will support his weight. Pisa Khan, even he, seemed to disappear into nothingness, but on his life, on his death, one was able to put them and put them one of the granite pillars of the Italian edifice. Listen to Piero Calamandre, representing the Rosselli family, as he speaks in 1945 in a courtroom in Rome during the Processo Rolazzo, the trial of some of the assassins of the Rosselli brothers. Disgraziati. You more than we, because you wanted to kill them, and you made them immortal. And in the mud of this trial, they bring a light of sunrise. Are the Rosellis dead? No. You are dead. You on that bench, and the sad ghosts were behind you. But Carlo and Nello, sweet friends. Youthful and smiling are here beside us. They watch all this immense ruin, this emptiness, but their brows are clear and their eyes serene, and they say, Non molare, don't give in. 
Thank you. Well, thank you, Joel, for your interesting and passionate paper about Roselli. The commentary on this paper will be delivered by a highly qualified scholar who is also from Florence and from Tuscany, as was Roselli. And uh, he is also a member of the Armed Resistance Against Fascism. I am, of course, referring to Georgia Spini, my good friend of more than 30 years, and who has uh, been wearing several hats at this conference, uh, <laughs> substituting for his distinguished son, Valdo Spini, who has uh, just been named Minister of the Environment in the present government of Amato. And, uh, taking part as commentator and chair of various sessions here. Feeney recently retired from full-time teaching at the University of Florence, but he continues to be very active in research and writing on a broad spectrum of topics. As most of you know, Professor Feeney's research interests cover a wide range of history, stretching from the Renaissance to the present time and spanning the history of developments in at least two continents. And his books include the major study of the modern age since the empire of Charles V, books on the Medici, on the history of the city of Florence. He has written pioneering studies about the role of Protestantism in Italian history, especially during the Risorgimento period. He has written a number of interesting and very helpful articles about uh, American history, particularly in the colonial period in New England. And he has written on the subject of socialism, on the forerunners of socialism in the 17th century, and many, many others. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, Joe Lispeen. Thank you. You all have admired this essay, really a masterly essay, by which Joy Black has outlined the personality and the political thought of Carlo Rosselli. I'm sure that you all have considered his penetrating analysis as a contribution of the highest value to our discussion. Now, I would like to underline, first, I would like to underline that this paper by Joel Black has a peculiar value because of the very fact of being the work of an American student. It seems to me a sort of uh, drastic denial of the of certain stereotypes which circulate often in the history departments of the United States when a modern Italian history comes to discuss. Black has George uh, Black has made absolutely clear that Italy was not always and only the country of Mussolini or in alternative of Gramsci. Uh, even less, Italy was only Don Camillo and Petrone's country. So, if uh, we want to have <coughs> a realistic vision of the Italian events of the last hundred, hundred, last hundred years. One has to give a serious consideration to the democratic and social current, to their intellectual richness, and to their often dramatic. Uh, yes, the 
Peter's Police and Democratic Italians had been less colorful than the black fur and of the Don Camillo. But uh, they hadn't been far more important and constructive. At this point, I could Nothing, to add nothing else. Uh, and perhaps it would be good, since probably you are bad. Uh, I could simply add that uh, Joel Black brought me back to the times of my earliest youth. I was, I think, 18 or 19 years old. Uh, the first time when I entered into the Archivio di Stato Florence. My goal was to investigate the history of the humanist of the 16th century, Antonio Brusli. I wrote an essay uh, on this man. <coughs> and there, in the study room of the Archivio di Stato in Florence, there I saw a distinguished young gentleman fair haired, blue eyed, as vaguely with a vaguely British countenance. And I was surprised. My little son was already famous as a student. <coughs> but the Joel Black paper was so stimulating intellectually that I cannot resist the temptation of proposing a couple of topics upon which further historical analysis could be developed in the future. One first topic, the relation, the rapport in Italian, relation between Carlo Rosselli and his brother Nello. Nello was not only the younger of the two, but also the less conspicuous for bravery or, or brilliant political strength. He was a man of action, uh, he was a man of studies. Carlo uh, identified himself with the cause of socialism immediately after. Matteotti's murder, Nello uh, joined the Unione Democratica, the Amendola's organization, uh, that is, he shows the position less advanced towards the left. Nevertheless, one has to uh, ask if this man of study, awkwardly harmless, peaceful, if this man, in reality, did not contribute more than one would think to the building of the doctrine of liberal socialism, socialism liberal, of, Rosselli, of Carlo Rosselli. It's known that Char Carlo uh, took into serious consideration suggestions and observations by Nello while he was writing the text of Socialismo Liberale. But beyond that, Nello gave with his, with his historical investigations, Nello gave a, the evidence that the socialismo liberale existed because it was already present in history, in Italian history. Uh, since the time of the Risorgimento, we men like 
Pisane and Montanelli. So uh, the socialism liberale was not a utopia, a something fantastic, but it had been a concrete political movement, a concrete a reality, and uh, a concrete revolutionary project. Is you remember Nello in his work, Martini and Bakunin, gave a historical picture which is uh, also today considered as classic in Italian historiography. In this panorama, in this picture, he outlined the beginnings of the socialist and worker movement in Italy. And uh, he underlined clearly its libertarian, its libertarian character. And the fact that the early workers' movement in Italy, the early socialist movement in Italy, was entirely far away from Marx. In other terms, Nello showed that the Carlos liberal socialist was not an abstract uh, thought, but it was the it was the, it continued a line of thought and of action, a historical line which was rooted already in Italian reality. One has to one has, one could ask himself if the influence of Nello would not. Uh, uh, Operate upon Carlo also as far as the identification of socialism with the ethical religious heritage of Judaism and Christianity, uh, to which Joel Black alluded so well <laughs> in his paper. The, of the two brothers, Carlo was the most secularized. Nello, the most thoughtful of religious problems. He was also a member of the Jewish Youth Organization, Federazione Giovanile Ebraica e Italiana. One, uh, I would think that without Nello, probably, Carlos' secularism would become uh, so total that it would become total, and that uh, the influence of the brother, actually, was instrumental, probably, to um, a deeper consideration of the religious fact. I'm thinking of Nello's influence when one reads the, um, the beautiful the pages of Socialismo Liberale uh, and the, the, the link of socialism with the prophet of the ancient testament, probably the influence of Nello, which underlines in the, in the talk of the two brothers this aspect. And with that, I arrive to my second point. Joel Blatt underlined very well that uh, the liberal socialist of Rosselli derives largely from a Judaic Christian heritage. 
it could be important to investigate which Judaism and which Christianity is involved in that. Judaism, and let me use the, this other Italian word, Hebraism, because the Italians, the common people, they, they call Jews the Jews, call them Hebraism, because Jews is associated with Judah, the traitor. Hebraism is more kind and respectful. Or, Italians call the Jews Israeliti. And Israeliti is associated with the glory of Israel and the kingdom of Israel. The common people in Italy have made a sort of self censorship and eliminated the, the, the world which looked as a fancy. So, the Hebraism, the, the Rossellist Hebraism, was that of the Italians of religion, or at least of family background of a Hebraic faith, or uh, at least family background of the times of liberal history. It's a, a kind of rare and exquisite flower, Christian flower, which flowered around the heart of the 19th century and lived until the tragic 1938, the year of the rational laws in Italy. It was, I, I called it a rare flower, because I don't believe that there are many equivalents outside of Italy. And here, we are here in America, that is, in a the country in which more Jews live than any other part of the world. Therefore, it will be worth the while that we, that I try to say something about this rare flower, the Ebraismo Italiano, which uh, I mentioned. And I think it's worth the while because I'm not a Jew, I have no Jewish connection in my family at all, I'm a guy from top to heel. Therefore, I think I can be historically objective. In many countries of Europe, Jews have felt themselves as guests, sometimes well accepted, sometimes ill accepted, sometimes tolerated, sometimes ill treated by the owners of the house. And uh, they had to learn the language of the house owners as something new in respect to the language which were more familiar to them. But the Jews of Rome are among the very few Romans who can trace back their ancestry surely to the times of Caesar. No Roman is so Roman as a Roman Jew. Absolutely. The other Italians immigrated into Rome. The, 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 a Roman Jew feels that he is the owner of the house. He is not a guest in, in the house of other people. The other people walk in the house later. The Roman Jews always 
for that peculiar Roman vernacular, the peculiar Roman vernacular. The Roman Jews taught the other Romans certain mm, uh, cooking, such as the Carchofia Lagidia. <coughs> the Tuscan Jews have often ancestors who once spoke Spanish. All the parts of the Tuscan Jews of Tuscany are of Sephardian uh, ascendants, especially the Ligorno, Livorno uh, Sephardians. But from since generations, they speak Italian, or better, they speak the, lo- the local vernacular of Livorno. They are more Livornese than, than any other man or woman. Livorno was built um, by the will, by the decree of the Grand Dukes in order to um, increase its population. The, Jew, the Jews were offered particular liberty, particular privileges. And so they had a, a chair in the building of the portion of, of the city. Uh, in the image I used, they are the masters of the dwelling. <laughs> they are the masters of the house. They are not the guests of anybody's house. So much as that uh, for a long time, the commercial law of the port of Leghorn was based upon the Sephardian traditions. Even the Christians <laughs> were ruled by Sephardian rules. As something of the kind could be told for Venice or Trieste, uh, although in these places Jews are from different places, the origins arrived, including Ashkenazi. The Italians of Jewish extraction felt themselves so um, strong because they had been a part in the building of the common house Italia. Together with the other Italians, they had contributed with enthusiasm since the beginnings of the Risorgimento, if you go to Rome, in capital, on the capital, on the capital there is a, a large inscription which commemorates the citizens of Rome who died fighting in, for the Italian Risorgimento, number of names. Uh, and you are impressed by the number of Clearly, Jewish names were on that on that stone, because of course, together with the other Romans, the Jews fought and died. Uh, Joel Blatt very well uh, remember that the uh, Rosselli were a family, a Jewish family, of strong resurgimento tradition, and from that derived a very important consequence, very important in my opinion. In Italy, Jews identified themselves and were identified by the other, by the, by the others, exclusively, exclusively because of their religion not because of some ethnic factor or linguistic factor. The Roman Jew is exactly a Roman. His, the difference is that he, he goes or does not go to the temple on Saturday, and the rest of the Romans usually don't go to the Mass on Sunday. That is the difference. <coughs> uh, so, under certain, in Italy, there were only 
Italians of Jewish persuasion, not, not the contrary, not uh, Italian Jews. Under certain aspects, their religious heritage made the Italian Jews more strongly Italian. The Risorgimento, the history of the Risorgimento, fought against the Pope to make of Rome its own capital. Under this profile, the Jews, the Italian Jews, were the, the, as champions of Risorgimento Orthodox. The, the reaction was identified with the ultra conservative Catholicism, and that was the enemy both of the Jews and of the rest of the Risorgimento Italians. In uh, a good part of the Italian patriots, followed the religious state of Mazzini. As it was told, the Rossellis were of Mazzinian ancestry. Now, according to Mazzini, Christianity was to be abandoned for a sort of universalist religion, humanitarian, humanitarian religion, whose God had all the traits of the God of the Testament. So a Jew could become a Mazinian without giving up nothing, anything of his peculiar Jewish heritage. And in the ranks of the Mazinian party, which was also a religion under certain aspects, he could join in a total equality with the other, with the other Italians. And I come to another point. Probably because of that, the Italian Jews were had adopted an attitude so generous and open-minded toward the Italian God. Goyim. In general, when the history of Jews is discussed in the modern times, is much attention is brought to the tolerance of the others toward the Jews. Never to the other side, how the Jews saw the goal and behaved toward them. From this point of view, the case of the Italian Jews is really something unique. The, the very day the Jews were liberated by the exclusion under which they suffered for centuries. The which was the thing of socialism, such as Claudio Treves, such as Emanuele Modigliani, such as the two brothers, the two brothers Rossetti. The flight from Lipari is a sort of symbol in a certain sense. When you speak of one Rossetti, modernist Jew, Loose, born Catholic, but intensely secularistic. The third, the, the third Nikti is the son of a Methodist pastor. So, this general attitude, which led to forms of cooperation with men of the of different uh, experience, of different confessional backgrounds. Therefore. The Italian Jews didn't feel their heritage, the ancient testament, as something to be kept closed inside their narrow circle, the narrow circle of a minority. But it was something, it, it, it is something which should be enjoyed in common with the others. But in, in, 
something which could be imposed for uh, humani uh, humanitarianism and, and in the a brotherly attitude, generous brotherly attitude towards the humble and the One <coughs> cannot, in my humble opinion, understand the lofty idealism of the two brethren, which has been described so well by Joel Blunt, without keeping in mind that the, at the bottom of their motivations there was the peculiar uh, heritage, the same heritage of, 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 of Treves, for instance, and moreover, the Treves and the Rus family uh, had in, in intermarriage, uh, intermarriage relations. So, uh, let me say that probably there is something more to explore in this, to explore in this case. One word, uh, one last word, uh, as curiosity probably, on Rosselli fighting in the First World War and later in the Spanish War. I'm not an expert neither in military history nor in Jewish history, and I admit that I, perhaps I'm wrong. But as far as I know, the first Jews who broke, bore arms, fought in wars after the, the, the destruction of the Kingdom of Israel were the Italian Jews who had a part in the regiment of war. And incidentally, they found the, the military life attracting enough that I best indifferently remember that the, in the Jewish middle class, the lowest fringe of the middle class, it was quite frequent that children, that young men entered into the military career. The profession of officer was typical of more than one Jewish, of more than one Jewish family. 